And so we look at the book Daniel. And in, in our English version of the scriptures, the book Daniel is listed among the major prophets. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are roughly four, uh, some people argue five uh, um, divisions or categories of books, uh, but it depends on how you see the prophets. So we have the Pentateuch, of course, which are the five books of Moses. That's from Genesis all the way to Deuteronomy. Then we have the historical books from the book of Joshua, and it carries us to the book of Esther. It goes a little further, really, but uh, that's another that's another thing. But it carries us to the book of Esther. We have the books of poetry, which speak of uh, Job, Psalm, Songs of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and Lamentations. And then we have the books of the prophets. And this category is further subdivided into two smaller categories. I shouldn't say smaller, but into two um, um, attendant categories. We have what is known as the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets, of course, are uh, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, Daniel, Jeremiah. Uh, these particular books are not seen as being major because their message was more important than that of Habakkuk and Haggai and Zephaniah. The, the reason why they are called major prophets is because of the size of the oracle. They, they are pretty long in comparison to the minor prophets. So it is not a qualitative difference that is being um, highlighted here, but a quantitative difference in the sense that the minor prophets are brief in comparison to the message of the major prophets, all right? So we want to recognize that fact. Now, we must understand that the book of Daniel covers and exceeds the full period of the Jewish and a little later, or a little further in the study, I am going to show some, some biblical uh, texts that highlights the period and the fact that this is a particular period of time that Israel spent in captivity. Now, the book has two basic divisions. And I'm I, again, I'm really trying to be as simple as I can. Um, so we won't go into some of the other little intricacies. But basically, to the average reader, the book has two major parts, chapters 1 to 6 and chapters 7 to 12. The first part of the book is written in Aramaic. It's a language that was used by the exiles, <coughs> excuse me, while they were in captivity. Yes. And the second part of the book is actually written in Hebrew. So the truth of the matter is this particular book was written in two different languages. What you find is that individuals have different reasons as to why they believe. But again, we're not going to be going into that too much tonight because what we are trying to do is to give individuals a basic understanding of the book. So we're not looking at the different arguments as to why the book is laid out the way it is, why it is actually structured as it is. No, that's not what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to just give knowledge as to how the book is divided. So the basic division of the book uh, really just focuses on about two or three things, right? First of all, the first part focuses on the life of Daniel and references made to him in the third person, uh, kind of with the understanding that someone was recording what was happening in his life, which again is a discussion that is for another time. But in the latter part of the book, where we get into a lot of prophecy, we find that Daniel speaks in the first person, I, Daniel, and he said unto me. So, so, so we kind of get that, right? The first part of the book is partly historical. And you're going to see that where it outlines the uh, deportation of these young men into Babylon, 
It highlights the reign of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It also highlights the idea that, that you know, the Babylonian Empire or the impact it had on the then known world. The second part of the book is prophetic, and it has a lot to do with uh, the action of God in the midst of world governments. In other words, it speaks of God's working and God's engagement with the Gentile world. Now, I want you to know it's big, you know, because normally, from a Jewish perspective, it is believed that the Gentiles are dogs. But here we see an understanding that God is engaging Gentile politics and he is literally speaking of what must come to pass to demonstrate his sovereignty over the whole um, process of, of Gentile governance, you know? And so it's very interesting as we will look at the latter part of the book that we find that God is, of course, sovereign over all. Now, the basic divisions of the book, again, the first part from chapters 1 to 6 highlights the Gentile succession of world power. And we'll see that as we continue. Uh, then in the we see the rise and fall of the great empires, namely the Babylonian Empire, uh, the Mede and the Persian, and such the like. Um, we see also the work of Daniel as a statesman across administrations, right? The second part of the book, which is partly, I, I should say, mainly prophetical, chapters 7 to 12, takes a look at the coming of a different kingdom, a kingdom of a different sort. Because while chapters 1 to 6 looks at the succession of earthly Gentile kingdoms, chapters 7 to 12 looks at the kingdom that comes from heaven. Daniel calls it a stone that is cut without hands, yes? And, and so you have an opportunity to also see the conflict, you know, um, between the world governments and the kingdom that comes from God. In this book, we see the rise of Antichrist and the end of the age. And I've said it to us before, brothers and sisters, that this book is the forerunner of the revelation. This is the book where the angel tells Daniel to seal up the book because the end is not yet. And when we skip over to Revelation, we see John weeping because no one was found worthy to open the scrolls. The same scrolls that were sealed in Daniel chapter 12 are being opened in chapters 5 and 6 of the book of Revelation. All right? So, so it is the forerunner of the Revelation. In short, it carries much of the same imagery as the book of Revelation. Now, some of the contemporaries of Daniel, in other words, they served during the time Daniel served, include men like Ezekiel, who was also a prophet in exile, Nehemiah, Joshua, and to some extent, persons declare Ezra as well. And, and this is Joshua of the remnant, because I want to differentiate between Joshua, the son of Nun, the one who took over from Moses, and this Joshua, who is the high priest, right? So I want to ensure that, that we, we, we distinguish that, all right? So Daniel had contemporaries, all right? Now, one of the things that sets Daniel apart as a part of the prophets is that all the other major prophets were prophets to the masses. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all of these men, prophesied to the people. But when we come to Daniel, Daniel was a prophet to the politician. Daniel's main sphere of influence was in the halls of world power where he represented his God with the kind of distinction that allowed tyrants to pause and to declare there's no God save the God of Daniel, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Daniel is what we call the seer or the prophet of Gentile history. He literally outlines the succession, the succession, sorry, of Gentile power as shown and revealed to him. In other words, he's a prophet of world governments. 
So what he has to actually show and to reveal is that the work of God in the plan, you know, is revealed even in the governments of the world. The plan of salvation and all that is a part of that is also connected to what takes place in the world. Now, I want us quickly, everybody, just to focus on the left side of your screen. We're going to be coming back to this to this particular thing, but please look where my cursor is because I just want to give you just a quick survey of the book, the different chapters. And there are 12 chapters listed here. So don't look at all the other pretty things. Just follow where my cursor is on the side that speaks to the historical, prophetical, right? That's to the left of your screen. And if you look here, you see chapter one. And chapter one has a lot to do with Daniel's personal history. So if you see it here, it's just a rundown of what is in the different chapters. And we look at the other things as we go on through the book. Now, chapter two has to do with Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the great world Colossus, you know? And of course, it's going to typify the, uh, the, the quality of world governments as we draw near to the end, which of course is that world governments become inferior as we draw closer to the end. Then chapter three has to do with the image of gold, a trial that was set up for the faith of the Hebrew children or the Hebrew men. They weren't boys, they're actually men. All right. Uh, let's go back. Yes. Um, chapter four gives us the tree vision where God speaks to Nebuchadnezzar regarding the fact that he's going to take down Babylon. Jeremiah, um, Nebuchadnezzar, sorry, saw a, a tree cut down at the stump and God was telling Nebuchadnezzar that he is going to cut him down to size. Chapter five, we see Belshazzar's feast and we will learn a lot more about him as time goes on. He was not the last king of Babylon, as you will learn, but he was the son of the last king of Nobonite. Nabonidus, right? That's the name. Some call him Nabonidus. But nonetheless, he was the last king of Babylon. In chapter 6, we see the famous story of Daniel in the lion's den. Now, now when we have come to chapter 6, if you note, it's almost an ending. So you, you see that there's a little um, section here that marks off an ending of sort to a particular um, stress or a particular focus, right, regarding the Babylonian Empire. But chapter 7 begins the vision, the prophetic part. So chapters 1 to 6 has to do with the historical portion, and chapters 7 to 12 have to do with the prophetic portion. So after Daniel chapter 6, we see the visions that Daniel had. The first one is the vision of the great beast. Yes, uh, that's in chapter seven. And then the vision of the ram and the he goat. And we're going to go into that. Then we see Daniel's vision of the 70 weeks. Then Daniel's vision of Christ is in chapter 10. In chapter 11, we see Daniel's vision of the Antichrist. And as we close in chapter 12, we see Daniel. Um, vision of the end times. So I, I just put that there for you to get an understanding uh, of how the book is, is really sorted out. And later on, we are going to be looking at this chart again in more detail. More detail. Amen? So let us move on. Now, I want to explain to us that Daniel, the setting of the book, is in Babylon. And, and why is Daniel in Babylon? This is because Daniel is in exile. And you may ask again, why is Daniel in exile? Because you find that the Lord promised Israel that as sanction and as punishment for her sins, he was going to allow her to be torn out of the land that he promised her and to become um, exiles 
in a land that was not their own. So, so what you find, and I must kind of give you a little context, because Israel and Judah became two separate entities. After the death of King Solomon, the scripture tells us that the land of Israel was split based on the prophecy that was given unto Solomon. And the land that was split literally contained 10 tribes, which was in the north. And those tribes were loyal, not to the household of David, but they literally sought to make Jeroboam their king. And that's another story um, for another time. But, but the kingdom was split in two. And the northern kingdom, consisting of 10 tribes, was named Israel. So we find that for the first time, Israel is not one entity. And then we are told that there are two tribes, along with the two half tribes, that remained faithful unto the house of David. And we call him Judah. So Judah, Benjamin, remained faithful. And I think the half tribe of Manasseh and Ephraim in the south remained faithful to the house of David. And so Judah was the name called, yes? Now, in 722 BC, the Assyrians came into Israel and smote Samaria, which was the capital, and took Israel into Assyrian captivity. So this is a different captivity here we're looking at him. Because in 722, one captivity took place. And you find that they were taken and they were scattered. The people of Israel were taken from their homeland and scattered all over the Assyrian Empire. And they brought up people from Assyria to come up into Israel and to intermix and interbreed with the people who remained in Israel after the majority were deported. Those children that were born of, of that mix of that engagement between the Assyrians and the Israelites are known as the Samaritans. And if you take a glance at the New Testament, you'll recognize that it says the Samaritans and the Jews have no dealings because the Samaritans, um, the Jews rather, saw the Samaritans as half-breeds. They saw them as not worthy. And by virtue of that, they avoided them and they scorned them. And so Israel was disintegrated as a nation. It no longer existed, really, because it was sub, um, subsumed into the Assyrian Empire. Not so with Judah. Judah persisted. But Judah was on her way to captivity because she was warned by Jeremiah as the Lord sent his word that they had seen what y'all allowed to happen to their unfaithful sister Israel. And they were going down the same line. But Judah refused to repent. And the Lord prophesied through Jeremiah and the other prophets that they would go into exile. Now, Judah's captivity was foretold by Moses from Deuteronomy. The idea that God highlighted from Deuteronomy was that if the nation, this new nation that he was putting together, disobeyed him, that he would scatter them onto a nation, right? This was also predicted by Isaiah about 150 years before, Isaiah 6, verse um, 11 and 12. Now, the place of captivity was also foretold by Isaiah and Micah. Jeremiah announced the time span for the captivity that it would be a period of 70 years. So Micah and Isaiah allowed the people to know that they would be sent to the north because the great lion from the north, Nebuchadnezzar, the one who would come with chariots like winged horses, you know, uh, they made clear that these, um, that this nation rather would become the destination of Judah in her captivity. Jeremiah announced that the time span of the captivity would be a period of 70 years. Let me read from that often quoted text that is devoid of context in most cases. 
about Jeremiah 29, 11, 10 and 11, you know? And I, I included um, verse 11 for you to understand. It's a text that a lot of people quote, and they quote it out of context. The context is Jeremiah speaking unto the Israelites before they, the, the Judahites rather, before they go into captivity and saying to them that you are going to go into captivity. But then he says to them, in verse 10, for thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years are accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you, causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an end, a future, and a hope, right? So we learn from this particular text, verse 10, that 70 years was determined in Babylon. Now let's look at Daniel 9, 1 and 2. And this is where we are now brought um, to a place where we understand the accuracy, the accuracy of Jeremiah's prophecy. It says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, came to understand by books, and I want us to understand by books, the number of years according to the word of the Lord as it came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would spend 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And, and so we understand that Daniel read the book of Jeremiah. And at this point in chapter 9, he is anticipating that the 70 years is approaching. And so he sets about uh, seeking God. He sets about uh, repenting for the sins of his nation and presenting his nation. So I gave us that just to establish that the exile was for a 70-year period. Now what caused them to go into that? A number of things, you know? And, and sometimes I think that, you know, we do not learn from the lessons that these uh, people have gone through. There was idolatry and religious infidelity. In other words, they were not uh, faithful to God. They practiced idolatry, yes? They would run after every new religion and every new God. And the Lord promised them that he would, in fact, cast them aside. There was also injustice towards their fellow man. And, and you can get the idea based on the prophecy of Amos. Amos prophesied that God was not interested in their burnt offerings. He says that when they burn the offerings and, 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 and the Savior come up, the Lord will stop his nostrils. And when they lift their hands and do the wave offering with the, with the meat of the sacrifice, God will turn his back. And he said that God would only receive the, the, the worship of Israel or Judah when justice rolled down like rivers and judgment like a mighty stream. Let me tell you about it was. Within the context, the cheapest thing in Judah during the period was a pair of sandals. And men would sell out their brother. They would throw their brother in jail for the price of a pair of sandals. And the Lord says that they were unjust. In the courts, the poor could not receive any justice because the rich bought out the judgment, right? So there was a corruption in the courts. There was also a corruption of the priesthood. When um, Amos came to prophesy, the high priest told him, go back to where you come from and go eat a food. In other words, this is just my, my job. And this is what I make my money from. For, for them or for him, the worship was not really important. The holiness was not important. So Amos had to say to him that I am not a priest. God had to bypass the priestly lineage. And find a man who was a shepherd. <coughs> Excuse me. And a keeper of sycamine. He was a farmer and a shepherd. And raise him up. <clears throat> excuse me, to be uh, the prophet. 
There's no momentum in her body. All right, thank you so very much for that. Sorry about the interruption. <clears throat> Arrogance was also high on the agenda because they did not care <clears throat> what they did. No matter how badly they lived, they boasted that the God of Israel would protect and defend them irrespective of what kind of lives they were living, okay? Mm. Let's see if we can move on. So, in essence, Israel's arrogance was seen in, in the way that they, they practiced their religion. Israel made the temple an object of false security. What do I mean? It was King Solomon who prayed, and he said to the Lord, if ever your people are taken captive, when they look to this place and pray, he was saying to God, I pray that you will hear them and deliver. Right? That is why Daniel, when he's in Babylon, he turned his windows to the east because he was captured in the north. So he turned his windows towards Jerusalem where the temple abode. Yes? The people also used the law as a mockery of justice. In other words, they use it for self-aggrandizing and for self-enriching. They turned the law against those who could not afford it. And of course, the ones who could, they used it to their benefit to lift themselves up in society. They turned the idea of divine separation into a curse. In other words, instead of seeing themselves as the evangelists of God to tell the rest of, of the heathen world about the goodness of their God, they literally spat on the other people. They, they did not see them as worthy of knowing the Almighty God. Yes? They made circumcision a fetish. Uh, it's what identified them as Israelites. And that's all it was. For them, it was just to identify them as sons of Abraham. Nothing with the covenant of God. They used the Holy Land for unholy practices. Yes? They literally caused all that God had asked them to cast out the nations or the inhabitants before them, they practiced the same things. And she boasted. She exalted her past, sinned in her present, and ignored her future judgment. And so the Lord decided to send Israel into captivity. All right? So let's see if we can see as the story begins uh-huh and we should be able to take you through let's hope that we can finish this part of the story this evening so i want to look at the opening verses of the opening chapter of daniel daniel chapter one verse one and two in the third year of the of the reign of jehoiakim king of judah came nebuchadnezzar king of babylon unto Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with part of the vessels of the house of God, which he carried into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God. And he brought the vessels into the treasure house of his God. Now, you must understand that there were three stages to the total defeat of Jerusalem and to the carrying away of the captives. First of all, according to verse 1 of chapter 1 here, Nebuchadnezzar came and defeated King Jehoiakim. So King Jehoiakim was actually on the throne and he was defeated. And so Judah became a vassal state. What's a vassal state? A vassal state speaks of a territory that has been defeated militarily or has consented voluntarily to, to, to come under the, the, the guardianship, so to speak, of a bigger, greater, stronger country. And in exchange, that country would actually receive taxes from them and they would swear allegiance to that country. So in the case of war, they would join with them in terms of defending 
the vassal country or the, con the suzerain, the country that is the sovereign one. The one that is put under subjection is the vassal. So there's a covenant treaty of the ancient world that is called vassal suzerainty. And that's the kind of thing that's happening here. When Jehoiakim was defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, he decided to bow his knee and to humble himself and to pay tribute or taxes to Babylon. But we learn that after three years, that this same King Jehoiakim, he rebelled against Babylon. And he was again defeated by Nebuchadnezzar, who bound him with chains, took him down to Babylon. During this deportation, part of the vessels from the temple was taken. And this first deportation, which took place in 605 BC, uh, Daniel went down in this deportation. So, so you find that it was under King Jehoiakim. And it is believed that Daniel was between 10 and 14 years old at the time. He was a young man. Yes. The second stage that took place a few years later happened under Jehoiakim, who is another king. Yes. He too did it with what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And Nebuchadnezzar came up and besieged Jerusalem. He soon broke Jehoiakim and deported him and all the princes, the craftsmen, the smiths, and the mighty soldiers down to Babylon. And the remaining vessels of the temple, those beautiful shields and vessels that Solomon had made of gold, were actually placed in Babylon. They were taken. The temple was also destroyed. And only the very poorest of the poor people were left in Jerusalem to till the soil. And the last straw was under King Zedekiah. This was the third and final deportation. Nebuchadnezzar again seized the city and put a blockade against Jerusalem because Zedekiah rebelled against him, joining up with Pharaoh. And that's the king of Egypt against, um, against Nebuchadnezzar. So what Nebuchadnezzar did is that they besieged the city, cutting off supplies of food and water into the city. And when the people began to flee from the famine, they were captured by the Babylonians. The city of Jerusalem was then set on fire and the walls broken down. In other words, no compassion was shown for the people. And only the poorest of the poor were left in the land. That is why when Nehemiah came and saw Jerusalem, he wept over her because she was a ruin. So that's how Daniel ended up down in Babylon. I want to use that term. Three waves of, 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 of deportations. Daniel was a part of the first. But there's something about this man, Daniel, that I want us to get. It is believed, everybody, that there were 10,000 exiles that went down in the first deportation. So in other words, 10,000 people were taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. But out of that 10,000, only four were highlighted. And it would appear that the other 9,996 compromised in Babylon. And, and that is deductive reasoning. But, but I want us to understand where this is coming from. Now, Daniel is believed to have been a young Hebrew of some standing in society, or he was of royal descent. Some people believe he was of nobility, all right? His family was never identified, but it is believed that he was coming out of nobility. It is believed that he was born in 621 BC, and he was born just prior to the time of the reforms of Josiah. So he would have been born in a time when Josiah would have found the book of the law and Israel would have been called back to the book. So as a child, Daniel would have been literally indoctrinated and taught and schooled and instructed in Torah, instructed in the way of the Lord, instructed according to the writings of Moses, right? So, so what we understand is that Daniel was born about this time. Now, what we know about Daniel is what we get from this book. He was taken down to Babylon again in 605 in the first deportation of Nebuchadnezzar. Now, again, there is strong indication 
that Daniel had some social stand. Back in Judah, in people, them have looked at something. They, they had a place in society. And it is believed that what happened in this first deportation under King Jehoiakim, Kim, is that Babylon demanded hostages of Judah to establish good faith. So when Nebuchadnezzar defeated Judah, in order to show Nebuchadnezzar that, that they were not going to rebel and they were going to be cooperative, they literally allowed Nebuchadnezzar to take 10,000 of their elite men, 10,000 of the elites down into Babylon. Yes? And the very best of them were chosen to be a part of Nebuchadnezzar's government. So, so you find that Daniel was deported to the capital of the Babylonian Empire in this time because he was a hostage coming out of Judah into Babylon. Now, scholars tend to cite three reasons why they took these young men of nobility into captivity. All right? First of all, holding them hostage in Babylon would ensure the loyalty of their families back in Judah. Because Judah was still flourishing and going on. But she was no longer an independent nation. So, so in order to keep them in check, to take these young men down as hostages or to use them in Babylon, it would have allowed um, them to think twice about rebelling. Just like what Hamas is doing with Israel now in capturing the Israelis as hostages, trying to use it as leverage against the Israeli government. The, the second thought is that they wanted to develop men that already had some education to serve in Nebuchadnezzar's bureaucracy. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was expanding his empire by the day, by the day. And there was a need for, for, for qualified men, educated men, to take the leadership in these provinces, yes, and, and, to, and to govern on behalf of the king of Babylon. And so that's another thought as to why these individuals were taken. But thirdly, some believe it was for indoctrination because they wanted to infuse these young men with the Babylonian ideals that they could better convey them to their own fellow countrymen. In other words, help them to bridge the gap in the Judean provinces, right? So they, these young men being a part of the, of, the, of the government would actually be a bridge for the Babylonians to engage the Judeans that the Judeans would not rebel, all right? Now, down in Babylon, Daniel is being groomed for royal service. No two years about it. For three solid years, he's in preparation. He's being instructed in Babylonian culture. And Daniel, along with his three companions, were indoctrinated to serve Babylon. Now, now one of the things that I want to highlight here is that there is a particular principle at work. Excuse me. It is a principle that the enemy still uses today, seeking to indoctrinate the people of God to be more attuned to this world than to the kingdom. In other words, he wanted to get Babylon down in them so badly because if you can infuse them with Babylon, then they would walk Babylon, talk Babylon, think Babylon. For as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So that is what they had hoped to do. Now, in order to accomplish this, Nebuchadnezzar gave a royal edict to the individual who was in charge of looking after these young men. So let's look at this royal edict and how it affected Daniel and his friends. Verse 3. Daniel chapter 1. And the king spoke to Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, youths in whom was no blem blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace 
and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. In other words, young men who already were educated, but also could be brainwashed. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at therefore they may stand, that at the end thereof, sorry, they might stand before the king. In other words, he was also bribing them to have the king's, a portion of the king's meat was a lot of food, you know, and of the very best quality. So he was actually bribing them. It's one of the things that you try to say to young people in particular. Do not allow the entrapments of the world to get the better of you. Because the only thing that is in the world, according to John, is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And so many a young person is tempted by what is out there. And even some of the elder persons are tempted by what is out there. And so we urge vigilance among the people of God. Now, you would have seen the term eunuch. Now, a eunuch was a male officer of a court or of the household of a ruler. The eunuch was often one who was castrated. Uh, he was male, but did not carry the male appendage because it was forcefully taken from him. The kings would actually have these eunuchs as their high officials. Why? Because the eunuchs had to also take care of the king's wives. And anyone would have conjugal um, interactions or intimate relations with the king's wives. If a child was born, the child could lay claim to the throne and also the individual who got the king's wife pregnant. That is why when you read the book of Kings and into Chronicles, when, when um, the brother of Solomon asked him to give him Abishag to wife, you know, um, he actually went to Solomon's mother and asked her to entreat Solomon to give him Abishag. That's Adonijah. That's why Solomon decided to kill him because Solomon knew he was making a play for the throne. Abishag was actually one of David's concubines. And if he was to marry her and to bring up seed, then you find he could also make a claim for the throne. So the eunuchs, that would actually also have charge over the harem of the kings, were not allowed to keep their appendages, lest they forgot that they worked for the king and wanted to take over. So it also minimized the motivation for assassination attempts because these men were trusted officials and, and trusted individuals with the king. So let's look at verses six and seven. Now among these children of Judah, those um, requested by Nebuchadnezzar, was Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuch gave different names. For he gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah, Shadrach, and to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. I'm hoping you're seeing what's happening here. When you look at the names that these men had, it had a lot to do with their identity and had a lot to do with their God. Remember, a name is actually a bark or a badge of identity. When you look at their names, you are able to see where their identity is. Their identity was forged in covenant with Yahweh. So, so Daniel, his name means Yahweh is judge. Hananiah, his name means Yahweh is gracious. Azariah literally meant Yahweh is my help. And Mishael uses the inquisitive, who is like Yahweh? So, so you recognize that these young men were named after the covenant God based on their Jewish heritage and based on the fact that they served only one God. Yes? But watch this. They were now given different names because this was an imposition of Babylonian culture. The aim of this was to eradicate their Jewish um, um, culture, to eradicate their theology, to eradicate their covenant to God. 
so so let's look at it the meaning of the new names they were given were literally given to contradict the original name so daniel became bel teshazar and it means bel will protect bel is one of the gods of the of the babylonians i'm going to show you a text with bel in a little while hananiah literally became shadrach the inspired of aku aku is another of the babylonian gods then we had mishael who was called misha right belonging to aku and finally azariah became abednego the servant of nego so these men were actually being offered up to a new god they were being uh literally proselytized they were trying to make them proselytes to a new religion but the first thing they had to change was their identity. And, and one of the things years ago that, that I, I spoke of regarding some of the practices that the church allowed through the gate about 20 or so years ago, you find that we knew that along with those practices uh, was not only what we would call a, a harmless like, entertainment or excitement for young people, but it came with a culture that was not necessarily godly, right? So, so one of the things that I want to literally highlight about the church is that the church is called to be counter-cultural. The church is called to go against the present culture. But what many persons have done is that they have sought to enter a thing that we call syncretism to mel in with the current culture, right? And, 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 and so to get into people's graces and, and not to rock the boat and not to make everybody say you're going holy like, you understand? But the reality is that's what the church is called to do. For Jesus said unto them, or unto us rather, you and only you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has lost its quality, wherewith shall it be salted? It's of no value but to be cast under the foot of men. So the first thing that these men tried to change about these young men were their identities. And that's what they've done with, 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 with the church. You are told that, you know, you can't look too holy if you look like a boy, you're going to dance out. You, you can't look as if, you know, you are dressed well. You have to put yourself together that other people don't feel that, that you're trying to be a holier than thou. And the devil is a liar. So what we find is that we have a culture that the church has adopted that is to some extent destroying our culture. Now, the, the oneness apostolics quarrel with them all you want. And I think to some extent, they can be a little too stringent, but they to a greater extent have held on to their culture. Now, I'm not saying that we should do what they have done, but the principle is what I'm highlighting. They have not sold out their culture. You cannot go into their particular setting and behave as if that you're on sting. Pulling up your, your crotch and, and calling, pull up. No, it doesn't happen. But the church has gone into syncretism. And when we speak of it, we are actually criticized and people seek to shame us that we are not moving with the times. And the devil is a liar. The reality is the people of God are different and we must be different now let me let me share with you from the book of isaiah regarding the gods bel and nebu isaiah 46 1 bel boweth thou nebo stupeth their idols were upon their backs let me see if i can get this properly upon their beasts sorry and upon the cattle, your carriages were heavy laden, and they are a burden to the weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They could not deliver the burden, but themselves are gone into captivity. God, through Isaiah, was sharing that the gods of Babylon could not even walk and talk. They had to be carried by people. And they could not say, but yet people wanted to bow down and to worship them. 
Daniel and his friends, however, remain true to their heritage. Even with a change of their name, their character remained. They refused to eat the meat or be tainted by the idol worship. In other words, these are the same young men who said unto King Nebuchadnezzar, no disrespect to your position, sir, but we refuse to dance to your music. We refuse to bow down to your idol. We refuse to embrace your form of worship. Yes? So even though they were down in Babylon, Babylon was not down in them. And I think that it stands as a principle that even though we live in a time of great apostasy, that it is not a must that everyone falls away into the practices and the cultural traps that have been set for this age. And so we, we normally use the term dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. And I want to encourage those who are listening to take to heart that according to God's word, this is what he's looking for. People who will stand for him even when the whole world is changing. Let's move on. One of the things that we recognize is that Daniel made a vow in his heart. Daniel declared that he purposed that he would not eat of the king's meat. Right? Let's look at verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the prince of the eunuchs, that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Let me get this um, through quickly. I left out ver um, verse 10 because it was just the response of the eunuch when he asked him not to allow him to eat of the king's meat, but to give him vegetables and water. The, the eunuch said to him, if you look any worse, yes, than the rest of the captives, the king will have my head. But when it says Daniel purposed in his heart, the, the term means he was determined. He set it as a principle of life. He determined in his spirit that he would not defile himself. He would not break his traditions, his Levitical traditions, that which he learned, his dietary traditions. Yes? And he would not pollute or stain himself. <clears throat> so the desire of Daniel is that though I'm down in Babylon, Babylon must not be down in me. Babylon must not be polluting me or staining me or even leaving any part of me stained by it, right? And by virtue of that, you find that he could approach the, um, the, the, the prince of the eunuchs, who, of course, God had given him favor with, and it's a hesed. Yes, he brought him into hesed. Mercy is the word you see there. This is the same term that is used when David says, surely goodness and mercy. That's the idea that God gave him favor, mercy in the eyes of his overlord and brought him into the raham, into tender love. Uh, that particular word carries the idea of a mother nursing a child in the womb, that, that, that the individual uh, has sympathy, tenderness, and, 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 and pity. It, it is what we call sensitive love, wherein Daniel is an, an, an enemy captive, but yet the individual who was the prince of the eunuch literally had tender love for him, sympathy, and looked upon him with kindness in the same way that Potiphar looked upon Joseph. Let's see if we can, we can continue. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuch had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Test thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the youth who eat a portion of the king's meat, as thou hast said, let me just make sure I got this right, I have something blocking the way here, everybody. Let me just make sure I get it right. As thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter and tested them 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the portion 
of the king's meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Now, when you look at what happened, you know, brothers and sisters, we find that God allowed them by supernatural providence. These young men tested the system and beat the system because God was with them. L let me share this with you. Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four youths, watch this. God gave them knowledge. God gave them, you know, it's, it's explicit here, knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding of all visions and all dreams. Now, you need to look here at the benefits. Benefits of trusting the Lord. Excuse me. You find, everybody, that God gave them good health. Their countenance was fairer and fatter. In other words, they look better than all the others. God also gave them what? Knowledge. He gave them instruction and information. He also gave them skill. And, and the word here is sakal. It means to be so circumspect, be prudent. In other words, God gave them a heart that was disciplined to study. He gave them a heart that allowed them to seek after knowledge. And in so doing, they were well-versed. Yes? No, no, the understanding here, you know, is not to highlight, right? Our Sakal does not here speak of, you know, just being bright with book matters. It carries the idea of understanding the reason for something. So it's not just reading. It is reading and having the understanding as to why the thing is. For example, in, in ancient Israel, and even current Israel, the male child was circumcised on the eighth day of, 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 of after birth. While it does not state, it was just a culture and a custom. But these young men would have actually looked deeper than that to recognize that after or in eight, in eight days after birth, that the vitamin K is highest in the blood. And the vitamin K is what is used for clotting the blood. The body uses that. And so if they had circumcised the baby before, the baby would bleed to death. So, so while many would just circumcise because it was commanded of God, the sakal here literally means that God gave them the prudence to recognize the reason why the thing was done. So they could explain to individuals a little more than just repeating information. God also divinely equipped them with all learning and all wisdom. Now this word all, the cowl, it literally governs the learning and it also governs the wisdom. Right? It, it is the same particle that governs both. So it is translated all learning, let me use my thing here, all learning and all wisdom. And this means all kinds of learning and all forms of wisdom. So when you look at the word cowl, it carries the idea of the entire spectrum. The whole thing in whatever sense. Learning here meant that God made them quick of intellect. He made them brain fast. They used them bright. Right? So they would have knowledge from study and knowledge from books. But he also gave them wisdom. The hukmah. And I'll, I'll repeat that word because probably... You, you probably didn't pick it up. It's pronounced chma. Yes? And it is the word that is used in the book of Psalm. When, when uh, Moses said, Lord, teach us to number our days that you may apply our hearts unto chma, wisdom. Yes? So, so the term chma speaks of insight. So not only were they bright, quick intellect, and in all areas of study. But they also had insight, intelligence, knowledge, 
and judgment. The term hotma is, 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 is a little stronger than um, knowledge. It is because it carries the idea of coming from God. It is one of the attributes of God. So the idea here is that God placed upon these young men whom he could trust. He placed some of his attributes that his name would be glorified. All right? But Daniel was a cut above the rest. And, and we're coming to a close soon. We're just going to finish this. Daniel was a cut above the rest. God gave him understanding. And in the Hebrew, it is been to distinguish between good and evil. And he is highlighted of being able to have mental insight. He was able to understand visions, the shazan. He had mental insight. He had revelations. Yes. And he was able to interpret dreams. Right. So with all of this going for them, even though they were in Babylon, God opened that door for the young men that they were lifted up and elevated. Right? Let's look at it quickly. It says, no, at the end of the days, verse 18 to 21, that the king had said he should bring them in. Then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. Watch this. And in all matters of Hma and understanding, been, the king inquired of them. He found them ten times better than the magicians and the astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Saul. Now the word matters here is the word davar. It means in all issues that came before the king. Yes that these men were effective and astute. So they had been uh, insight and intelligence and prudence. So not only were they looking better, fatter and fairer, but they had uh, God-given gifts. And these gifts made room for them before the king and caused them to stand before great Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel had a grasp of any topic that Nebuchadnezzar desired. That's what set him apart. He had a grasp of any, every, everything. And the truth of the matter is, none of the magicians who were actually um, Babylonian sages, they were people of the Babylonian court. Some of them were, were Egyptians. You know, they practiced the occult, sorcery and incantations, right? They were astrologers. They read the stars. They were conjurers who conjured the spirits of the dead. Yes, and they were necromancers. They prayed to the dead. None of these were able to overcome or to shine like Daniel and his brethren because God elevated them. And finally, let's look at it. God gave Daniel long life. Verse 21 says, he lived until the time of King Cyrus. That means he would have outlived Nebuchadnezzar, outlived Nabonidus, who was the, the son of Nebuchadnezzar, outlive Belshazzar, he would have outlived Darius, and he would have lived during the time of Cyrus. He lived with purpose. The kingdom that employed him was benefited. The nation of Israel that depended upon him was benefited. He had spiritual insight for the governments of the time. And he spoke, prayed, and proclaimed spiritual deliverance to the people of Israel at the end of the captivity. My brothers and sisters, as we stare into the wisdom, the chma of the book of Daniel, we want to ask the Lord to make us like these young men. Young men who will reject this world. Young women who will reject this world and embrace the cross. Elders who will stay true to the old rugged cross, even though it is now so despised by the world. I pray that this is our prayer. Also, I ask that we continue to seek the understanding by reading the intellect to have God give us wisdom and insight and learning that we are able to stand and to defend the faith in this time. 
that is the ending of our lesson tonight. I want to thank you all for joining with us. And I'm going to say to those, especially those on the YouTube platform, a very special good night to you. God bless you. And I ask that you take care and join with us next week as we look into chapter 2 of Daniel, as we go deeper into the life of this great prophet and the message that God gave him for the world. God bless you, everyone. Have a good evening and take care.